thank you everyone for coming again. Um, and now that we you know, heard Nir talk about building those habit forming products, maybe we can switch gears a little bit and talk about how to hook the investors um, to help you build those products. Uh, as quick background, uh, my name is Prasanna Krishnan. I'm founder of SmartyPal, a learning technology company here in Philly, um, and uh, also very excited to join the PSL board. Um, my background falls into three buckets. Uh, VC, early stage VC, I used to be in the Valley, uh, larger tech companies like Microsoft and Comcast, uh, and venture-backed um, startups. Uh, so I've sort of been on uh, both sides of the table uh, when it comes to fundraising. But what I'm really excited about is our panelists today really span the spectrum across stages of investing, geographies, and really having been on both sides. So I'll start with uh, maybe th taking 30 seconds if each of you could just introduce yourself. I'll do that, but first I want to take a picture just like Nir. I don't have as many Instagram followers, but I still would like to take a Thanks for having me. Uh, my name is Karan Mahandru. I'm one of the partners at Trinity Ventures. We're an uh, uh, early stage tech VC firm in the Valley. Um, and I've been with the firm for about, uh, I think, just over seven years now. I started in 2010. I worked in a late stage firm before that for three years. And prior to that, I was on the operating side for about 10 years, having done uh, various roles in product development, marketing, and sales. Um, I think I'm one of the few VCs that has actually carried a bag, had a quota, and sold software. So uh, that's one of the ways I distinguish myself. Uh, but at Trinity, we're, we're a $400 million fund. We're on our 12th fund now. We've been around for 30 years. I started our, our path uh, back in the 80s, funding companies like Starbucks and Jamba Juice and P.F. Chang's. And we've come a long way since then. Um, and I think the most relevant part of my investment uh, record is probably uh, an investment in RJ Metrics here in uh, Philadelphia uh, and Stitch Data. If I were accounting my activity in Philadelphia, I'd say I've done one investment. If I were marketing it, I would say it's two. <laughs> so, so you can take it any way you want to. But really, really happy to be here and uh, sh uh, glad to spend a few minutes with all of you guys. Uh, my name is David S. Rose. I'm the early, early side, an angel investor, uh, serial entrepreneur. Started half a dozen companies starting when I was about uh, 12 years old. Uh, started companies in high school, college, graduate school, so on and so forth. Uh, started a company that got really big during the dot-com boom, then really small, then really big, then evaporated during the dot-com crash, after which the spousal authority revoked my entrepreneurship card. Uh, so at that point, I had to turn to being an investor to the dark side. So I became an angel investor, started investing in, uh, in seed stage startups, ended up as an entrepreneurial type, founding New York Angels, which as you know is one of the leading angel groups uh, in the country, if not the world. Um, at this point, I've invested about 120 companies in my own personal portfolio. Uh, New York Angels has done probably 15 million this year in, in seed stage uh, deals and has invested in hundreds of companies. Uh, along the way, I got involved with a bunch of other things in this space, uh, including Singularity University, which some of you may have heard of, which, which I'm an associate founder and founded their finance and entrepreneurship track. Uh, um, and then I finally got permission to start another company again, so I started a company called Gust, which uh, I think probably several people here in the audience are familiar with. Uh, Gust is the infrastructure platform for the whole early stage world. Uh, so today there are well over 500,000 companies who use Gust to connect with over 75,000 accredited investors. Uh, we back end the majority of the world's angel groups and accelerator platforms, over 2,000 investment organizations. So um, with all of those folks coming on, we have enough critical mass, so we also uh, provide the power for the back end uh, of the official online hubs for the startup communities in New York City, Boston, London, and a bunch of other places like that. So uh, I hang out in the very early stage world. Um, the latest thing we're doing with Gust is we created a software as a service platform called Gust Launch, which lets you start a whole uh, high growth company by pressing a button for 99 bucks. So it's an it's a ongoing SaaS platform for starting and managing a high growth company. Cool, I'm Charles Hudson. I'm the managing partner of Precursor Ventures. I started the fund about three years ago, basically because I felt like all the folks that used to write seed checks now want to see traction, and there was just a gap in the market to help people, predominantly first-time founders who wanted to get that first million dollars. Before that, I was a partner at Uncork slash SoftTech for about five years, proud investor in uh, RJ Metrics from the early days. And uh, we're a 
nationally focused pre-seed firm. So we have 80, we've made 80 investments so far. We have 12 companies in New York, none in Philly yet, but two in Boston, one in Baltimore, two in the Carolinas, one in Tampa, three in Toronto, one in Pittsburgh, one in Chicago, and one in Cincinnati. So we believe you can find great companies anywhere. And so I'm um, really excited to be here. And, and thanks in particular to, to Bob for giving the opportunity. Thank you very much. So I'll kick it off with saying, um, you know, venture investing is part science, part art. Um, and really to sort of start with demystifying that, uh, as you look at companies through the diligence process, are there certain key questions or a rubric that you have, any key metrics that you always look for? Um, and maybe we'll start with you, um, Karan, and, and, and go down. And we'll reverse that for the next question. I was going to say, this is probably a great question to go in this order, because yeah. that's usually how the companies come. Be less data. Uh, <laughs> <laughs> um, yeah, actually, there, there is. I mean, for us as a firm, um, we've done everything from, you know, uh, you know, a PowerPoint with nothing more and uh, companies that have 10 million revenue. So we see the entire gamut and potentially even beyond. Um, I'd say the way I think about investing in, you know, Series A or seed companies versus something that's later stage, um, at the very early stages, you know, there's a lot of things we think about and, and it's the same cliched stuff that most VCs will say on a panel about team, market, this and that. The, the thing that I uniquely uh, focus on in companies that I look at is this concept of what I call founder market fit. And I think product market fit is a bit of an eventuality, almost a lagging indicator of, uh, of what we would want to see as leading indicators of companies that we want to get involved in. And I've always held this notion in my mind that founders in general are not perfect circles. They're not great at all, everything. And they're imperfect and exceptional in various dimensions. And the thing that I potentially would look for in a company is, are they exceptional in the dimensions that the market that they're going after cares about? And it may be somebody that is a selling a DevOps tool to developers versus you know, Bob and Jake selling a marketing dashboard to marketers, um, or an infrastructure engineer selling storage appliance to IT administrators. But, um, but the skill set that I'm looking for is, is, is if that skill set that they're great at relevant to the market that they're going after. And I think the, what comes out of that is the realization that at that stage, almost nothing that they present to you is anywhere close to the reality of what would make this company successful. And it's not a straight shot to glory. They're going to pivot multiple times. The business model will change. The pricing will change. But if they're uniquely qualified and they have deep empathy for the customers, the pain that they're trying to solve, and they've lived that pain, they will see around the corner before anybody else in that category. And, and to me, that is a comforting thought and an idea to back a company with, knowing that this founder has unique insight into the markets that they're going after, and they excel in the areas that the market cares about. So that's the early stage side that we look for and I look for. In the later stages, I think it becomes almost easier. Uh, it it's more of a can you win deals more than can you detect greatness. Um, and everybody looks at metrics around growth and efficiency and um, you know, customer efficiency and, and churn and retention and all that stuff. I spend a lot of time in SaaS um, world, so 70% of my portfolio is software as a service, and, and I think that has become pervasive across verticals, and a lot of people understand SaaS business models now. So, And I spend a bunch of time around um, other areas of enterprise, but I'm mostly in B2B. So that part of it is a little bit more straightforward, yet it's still still early in the, in the grand scheme of things. But I think it's the, it's the early stage, the, the art, as you, as you put it, um, where I think it's, it's helpful as investors to think a little bit more granularly about what is it that we're actually looking for and actually put it out there. It's like it may be that this is a great opportunity and this is a great team, but it's just not a great fit. It's not a founder market fit. And I've actually blogged about it multiple times. And that's something that I, I personally look for. I second all of that. That makes perfect sense. Um, I would note that the if, uh, two things. One, I think of myself primarily as an entrepreneur, as an investor almost secondarily. I mean, I, I eat, live, and breathe entrepreneurship. And as I said, I've been starting companies since I was a kid. So I feel for you because I am one. I'm sort of here as a pretender in the middle of all these you know, in, investor types. Um, and one of the things that I see, a consistent mismatch of expectations between founders and investors is on this question of idea versus traction. 
Um, and all of us entrepreneurs have an idea, and immediately we think that it's, okay, this is the worst greatest idea. Of course these guys should see it. Of course it's going to be a big success. So just go ahead and write me a check, and then, I'll, and then of course you'll, you'll see that it's going to be a big success. Whereas, you know, people on the other side of the table say, yeah, well, you know, there are a lot of people in this room over here, right? And not every single one of those is going to be a, a success. So therefore, it would be helpful to, for us to figure out which ones have already shown something, some kind of traction, some kind of success that's been demonstrated over there. Uh, and so one, one of the things that I, I find fascinating is that at Gust, our deal flow at Gust for companies applying to accelerators and angel groups and incubators and so on and so forth is over 10,000 companies every month. And you want to know an amazing, a fascinating statistic? Of those 10,000 companies, they're all looking for money. They all think they're high growth. Half of them are not yet even incorporated. Not yet even incorporated. I mean, they may be great on business, they may have great visions, but if they haven't done anything yet to even get there, you know, just to write, to write a check yet, they're talk, they're, there's a, a mismatch in terms of what you need to be funded. And so at this point, uh, even for early, early seed things, I mean, sure, all of us have, have written checks to people with an idea, but that's the, that's the outlier. That's not the typical way of doing things. Because if you have a great idea, the odds are there's somebody at the next table here who has a great idea and has also done something about that idea and actually gotten something done. So the first thing I, w I would say is your, real, your traction at whatever stage you are, whether you're a, a pre-seed seed, A, B, whatever, different kinds of traction in different areas. Certainly when you get into later stage series A and series B SES, there are absolutely defined you know, metrics there. If you've been to this, the SESTER conference this year, you'll know, but, you know, if you don't hit A, B, C, D, E, F, and G, you know, perfectly and exactly matched, you know, uh, you know, whatever, work day or something, then you don't even, you know, think about asking. But even at the earliest stages, very, very early stages, we look for some indication that there's somebody other than you who thinks this is a great idea. Do you have um, people who, you know, happy beta users? Is your, your net promoter score, you know, 70? Do you have, um, has anybody actually bought your thing, whether it's a Kickstarter or a campaign or people are beating on your door doing anything. Show us something other than just saying, I've got a really great idea. So that's the first thing. And then the second thing, in terms of what I personally look for, I, I, because I am an entrepreneur and I think like an entrepreneur and I love entrepreneurs, I have an unfortunate predilection for entrepreneurs. So I am always looking to find the entrepreneur. And I think every company has got one and only one entrepreneur in it. You can have a founding team, you maybe should have a founding team of two or three people, whatever it is, but there's always going to be one person who, capital T, capital E, is the entrepreneur. And in, in my book, The Startup Checklist, which is an interesting book about how to actually the nuts and bolts of starting a company, there's a chapter four is about building your dream team. And the key question there is figuring out who the entrepreneur is in the company. And this is sort of like the, the, the founder market mix over there, but it's the fa getting a founder in the first place. If you don't have somebody, if you or your partner partner is not an entrepreneur, that 1% of the crazy population who will drive this, who is ready to give up work-life balance um, and, and just push this thing through, then you have effectively zero chance of actually making the company a success. And in my experience, if you have an entrepreneur who really is a driven entrepreneur, that is, tends to be the primary indicator that you can get something done. You may crash and burn ultimately, you may, but at least you'll get out of the box and get going. So personally, I look for the entrepreneur, am I getting that vibe that this is an entrepreneur. So I'm going to say something totally different. I think early stage traction is kind of bullshit. Listen, you're all entrepreneurs. So if I told you all to get a meeting with me, you need $1,000 in revenue to get a meeting. I guarantee you every single person in here would find a way. You'd get your brother, cousin, mother, uncle. Someone would pay you $1,000 and you would check the box. And if it were all metrics driven, you wouldn't need a person. You would just send a spreadsheet in, Spreadsheet would look at all the data, growth rate, churn, when you start the company, how much progress have you made, and it would spit out an answer. So like I have a different view. As a small, I run a very small venture fund. The biggest risk to me is not losing my money. It's actually not making any money. Like my investors, if I take a bunch of big swings and I give them zero bucks back, they'll say, well, you're definitely not getting a second fund, but at least you took really big swings. If I give them back a dollar for doing a bunch of really safe, boring, small companies, they're going to say, I don't need you to do that. I can, I can do better than that in the public markets. So I have a different view. I think people focus too much on early stage traction without asking the big zoom out question of does this team have a really good, interesting, and the most important unique view on their market. So I see tons of companies, and the thing that scares me is I'll see three companies that are all building a marketing automation tool, going after the exact same customer, with the exact same pricing model, with the exact same go-to-market, 
And I said, well, you guys are going to kill each other. It's going to be like a traffic jam. You're all trying to get off the same freeway at the same time in the same lane. And you're not going to fail because the market's not big enough. You're going to fail because you're all trying to do the exact same thing. And I see this all the time, and I bet Karm does, in B2B SaaS. You, you start scratching any category, and you'll find 10, 15, 20, 25, or God forbid you look at a Luma chart, hundreds of companies in the same category. And I just say, I don't know. If I were a customer and you said there's 100 companies out here doing the same thing, I'd say, I give up. I, I don't have the time, energy, interest in figuring out the subtle differences between your products. So I'm looking for people who are doing something that they think is very different. I'll give you a very tangible example. One of the best portfolio companies we have is a company called The Athletic that does subscription sports. They direct to consumer, media company, subscription sports. If you ask most VCs, what do you hate? Media companies, subscription businesses, consumer. So you know how many competitors they have? Very, very few. And when I met them, most people said, there's no reason to invest in this business. A, media's broken, B, consumers won't pay, and C, they'll never be able to accumulate enough talent to make the model work. Well, it turns out that most people were wrong. It's actually a very good business. And what I find is that people who have unconventional ideas or pick weird markets just tend to think differently. And whether they win or lose, they don't end up having to beat 100 people. They might be in a race that has zero winners, but it's usually because they just picked an idea that, with some benefit, didn't work out. And what scares me more is to find someone who has a business that's 10, and this should scare you as an entrepreneur, that has $10,000 in MRR or evidence traction, but that 10 only goes to 100. It never gets big enough to have warranted raising venture, and you and I both end up stuck, because you have a business that's maybe interesting for you, and that I would never sort of torture you into making it something it isn't, but it's not gonna be the kind of business that I thought it was when we were gonna invest. So I really, you know, we, we tell everyone, if it's too early for everyone else, it's probably perfect for us at Precursor, because I find it's actually easier for me to analyze the quality of a team and an idea without traction. I just want to riff off something that Charles said, which I think is, is, is really important. The, you know, one of the, the, one of the things that we actually actively talk about it within Trinity, um, beyond the founder, which is a big part of the discussion at the early stages, um, is the element of timing. And, and a lot of times, there's the right market and the right founder, but there isn't that answer to the why now question, which makes it uniquely relevant for this company at this time to do whatever it is that they're trying to do. And a lot of times we found that if you get that element of why now, we actually went back to our 30-year history and looked at all of the successful companies we've invested in. And, and, I, will, and I will tell you, like the, the one piece that some the, the best companies got right was the timing element of it. And, um, and I also agree with Charles in that, you know, for a firm like us for 30 years, we'll raise our next fund. But whenever we get the hard questions, it's not because you lost money on one investment or two, it's because you missed the 10 in the year that actually matter. And th if you look back on those companies, I mean, we have a few of those, but just give you a couple examples, like even a company like New Relic, where we were, we invested pre-revenue, there was nothing there. And they were going after a market that at most was $100 million. It was a Ruby on Rails monitoring product. There wasn't a lot of Ruby on Rails developers. The market was $100 million. And there was this founder that basically had this insight. And he was, st he was at Wiley, which was essentially an applications monitoring platform on-prem. He's just like, look, the whole world is moving to cloud. And none of those systems are suited for the new infrastructure environment that everybody's going to be computing on. And so, and if the applications are moving to the cloud, then the monitoring has to be cloud hosted as well. And that was that unique insight and the why now piece. And they kept innovating and innovating as the market matured. So that why now element of it was, was really special. And then it's layered on with this like relentless tenacity and execution and grit that follows beyond it, but it was also driven by that founder that just kind of saw the corners at every step, and the market just became from 100 to 200 to a billion to now, I think the company's valued at over 2 billion and, and it's public. So it's just, and you never know at the outset how big the market is. So we don't spend a lot of time on spreadsheets around TAM sizing, like, I don't know. By definition, if you're early, the TAM is small. And so there's no point running spreadsheets around market sizing when you don't even believe the numbers that are gonna come out of it. So anyway, I just wanted to uh, offshoot some of the the, the points that you mentioned. I'll add one, one last thing too. We at Precursor, we focus totally on bottoms up TAM. Because you telling me that enterprise software is a $50 billion market does not tell me at all how you're gonna find your first customer. We focus on bottoms up TAM, like who's the customer, what's the pain point, what do they buy. For the people who use it, why'd they pick you, what else do they consider? And I find the founders that are really 
engage with their market, even with two or three customers or sometimes zero customers, can actually have a really intelligent, informed conversation on a bottoms up TAM. Whereas whenever I see one of these big circles with a 10B in the middle, like my eyes glaze over it. It just doesn't mean anything to me. Yeah. So thank you. Great discussion. And I'm glad, Karan, you brought up you know, one of my big lessons learned, which is getting the when right is harder than getting the what right. And, and six months too early or six months too late can, can kill a startup. Um, so kind of continuing on that note, uh, I know this is specific to each company, but if you look at broad spaces or technologies, uh, you know, what are your kind of hot buttons or things that you are either really excited about right now from a technology hype cycle perspective, um, where different technologies are, uh, and anything that you feel entrepreneurs should start of, should be wary of and not jump into? Okay. Well, in terms of one thing I think entrepreneurs should not go jumping into right now is ICOs. Um, so, th th so, you know. Yeah. So no virtual cats with Bitcoin? Uh, what about? Yeah, you know, I mean, for, for what's fascinating, for those of you, uh, there's a, a website called Quora, which is a question and answer website that I happen to be addicted to, and I write a whole lot of answers on, on, on Quora. And it, like every day, there are six more questions of, you know, what's the difference between an ICO and an IPO, and should I go, you know, an ICO as opposed to raising money on Kickstarter? I mean, people have no clue. I mean, the, the number of companies, I was at, a, at a, an event where the, somebody who's a real expert in the space was saying, well, you know, about, uh, you know, 80% you know, of all these current ICO things are scams, and and about you know uh, you know 19% are well-meaning but idiocy you know and maybe there's like one percent that have any kind of remote viable anything out there right so so uh, so all the if you're thinking about doing an ICO unless you started from the bottom the bottom up and realizing you had a solution which had to be solved by a cryptocurrency where the 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 you know extra benefit at the end of the day you happen to have a token over there otherwise so forget so that that hype cycle is, is literally insane at at this point um, but I think one of the really interesting ones is SaaS, because SaaS, as, as you pointed out, is a, is a, you know, it's a major established market. You know, 20 years ago, 15 years ago, it was a non-existent market, you know, and then you had Salesforce and a bunch of others, and all of a sudden, it became big. But what SaaS, SaaS was one of those major sea changes where everything that was software went online, went into the cloud, uh, and, you know, I, I, I'm, I'm sort of torn on SaaS, because on, on the one hand, there are, you know, all the major things, you know, it's like all the patents have been invented or whatever, is, so all the major things have, you know, have, have SaaS. Uh, things out there. On the other hand, anything that anybody is going to do, I think, in the future, the vast majority of it is going to be ultimately SaaS-based. So I'm sort of bullish on SaaS in uh, in, in that sense. Um, and uh, so so I, I think that what we have yet to, to really fully grok, and this gets back to the whole singularity thing and the, and the exponential growth of technology, literally every single thing around us is heading towards IT. Every single industry, every single business is heading online into the cloud um, in you know, mobile and virtual and, and everything. So you know, all these people who were doom and gloom sayers and oh, you know, the hype cycle of all this stuff is go, you know, mobile is dead and SaaS is finished and, and you know, uh, you know, there's only one blockchain and so on and so forth. Literally everything around you. I, I, I am constantly amazed by having people pitch me with things that I never thought of doing, um, but that are, are traditional businesses or traditional, something that's happening out there in the real world that is now being done. So I'm, I'm bullish in, in that sense on everything because I think we have a wide open market on all these things that are traditional businesses that are moving uh, into the new world of tech. So I'll take a slightly different tact on sort of the answer. And I usually cringe when I've been at, when I'm asked, what markets am I excited about or what markets entrepreneurs go after? Because I think, to me, I mean, there's nothing less exciting than hearing a story about an entrepreneur that put out 18 different markets on a whiteboard to see where they could make money and then chose one where the market is really huge and VCs would fund. Like, that's not what I'm doing, what I do for, and, what, and that's not what attracts me about a founder. And this goes back to my point, is like, what you do has to be deeply authentic to you, and that is exciting to me as an investor. Whether or not VCs would fund it or not, it should almost not matter. Like that's the kind of irrational thinking that founders need to go into pro solving a problem that they feel uniquely qualified to do. Um, there are secular trends that I think you should all be aware of. We should all be aware of, and we spend a lot of time thinking about it. Um, you know, and I could go on and on about like machine learning and things like that, where I think those are all secular trends. And there's some really exciting, interesting applications that will be built on. You know, machine learning, for example, um, similar to you know how uh, computation was built when arithmetic, the cost of arithmetic went to zero, 
I think machine learning puts the cost of prediction to zero, so there'll be really interesting applications built on top of that. But should you or that person or I go build a machine? No, no, I don't know. I mean, I, you know, you could be a marine biologist doing stuff around aquaculture that'd be more interesting to me because you are uniquely qualified to do it. So to some extent, I think it, this is outside of like the academic exercise of what markets are hot. I think you have to make it really personal and authentic. And I think if you do that, it's a lot more attractive to early stage investors, uh, especially for myself. And I think if you, if you did that, you actually s give yourself a real shot at success because if you think about all of the successes, now enterprises might be a little bit different because if you keep your ear close to the ground, you sort of know what the range of motion looks like within the next two to three years. If you look at all the consumer hits, they all came out of left field. There was no market. There was no whiteboarding of anything. It was just driven out of some unique insight by some really sharp entrepreneur and founder who understood something around habit forming products in a particular area or some market that they were uniquely qualified because they felt the pain. I mean, that's what RJ Metrics was born out of, right? Rob, Bob and Jake sat there and, and built spreadsheet after spreadsheet in a private equity firm. It was like, there's gotta be a better way to this. And nobody, I didn't ask them how big that market was. It was like, they were uniquely qualified to do that. So I feel like those are the, that's the right way to approach the problem and the solution as opposed to in an academic exercise. But that's just, that's just my personal view. Who in here has a coin? Who in here has a Coinbase account? There must be some of you here. So imagine running Coinbase in 2015. No one cared about Bitcoin. Like Bitcoin was on the backside of like the first wave of the hype cycle. The only way you keep working on crypto at that time is because you're like a believer, and you think it's an interesting product, and it means something to you. So the only two kinds of things we really get excited about at Precursor are things, to David's point, where the founder has some irrational enthusiasm about something that I don't understand, but because they're enthusiastic, I want to understand it. Or something that's so out of favor, which I'd say right now is consumer, that's so out of favor that most people think can't work, that again, you kind of have to be either high conviction contrarian or insane and really wrong to start. Because the problem is, if you start a cryptocurrency company today, you're starting at like peak enthusiasm. You're going to have the most competitors, and, if it, and invariably you're going to have a trough. And if, to Crumb's point, if it's a whiteboard business, you're just going to shudder. You're going to go, well, I didn't get into cryptocurrency to struggle. I got in cryptocurrency to make money. And what I find is that almost every great company that I've been a part of at Uncork or at Precursor has a year or two where the thing that they do is really, really unpopular. And if you don't have <coughs> an attachment to the problem or the team, it's very unlikely that you're going to ride out those difficult times. You'll shudder. You'll acquire, you'll pick a new problem to attack. So I can give you a couple specific things I like. I think, you know, from a secular trend, I think computer vision and robotics are colliding in some really interesting ways. And not just self-driving cars and agricultural robotics and aquaculture. There's a lot of areas where computer vision and the ability for machines to see and improvements in machine mechatronics and the ability to touch and move and manipulate objects allows you to do things that machines couldn't do five years ago. And those have tremendous implications on labor markets, cost of production, but are interesting. And then I really like things that, from day one, ask the consumer to make a binary decision, are you willing to pay for this or not? Because we have a secular bet that ad-supported media is on its last legs for most people because Google and Facebook make all the money in online advertising. So how do you run any kind of media company if you're primarily relying on ads? I think it's gonna be really tough, or you're just gonna be relying on Google and Facebook, and maybe that's fine. But I'm not really good at picking ideas. I think I'm good at picking people who already have ideas. So we also tend not to pick the person who's like, I'm really smart. If you give me half a million dollars, I'll come back to you in three months and tell you what we're going to build. We have to have enough meat on the bone around the problem to understand whether it's something we think has real potential. Yeah, I was just <laughs> I've always said to entrepreneurs, don't, don't ask VCs for ideas and don't listen to VCs because we don't know what we're talking about. And if you ask three VCs, you'll get four opinions because one of them will contradict himself at some point. <laughs> and so don't come to us. Got it. Thank you. So it, it's great to hear how you know, central the entrepreneur, their personal pain, their experience is to the passion, but also to what they bring to make this, make this thing successful. Um, and, and so when it comes to the person, though, you know, the one thing uh, that is, Obviously, you have a sense of what, what has worked, what you're looking for in people, um, and it's a lot of pattern matching. But the one thing that that ends up getting hard with is diversity. And, and, and the reason I'm saying this is not just diversity in terms of you know, race or, or gender, but even in terms of background. And this is something I, you know, I, I thought about and, th and, and saw a lot of in the Valley. So the, the unconscious bias that you know, is 
a big part of making that decision about uh, the founder, the individual, which is ultimately central to the company and your investment. Um, how do you think about uh, being conscious of avoiding the unconscious bias, uh, if I can ask? And, and, and really to the point of being able to you know, fund the entrepreneur regardless of what dimension they might fall on in terms of all these other factors. I'm happy to go first. I mean, I'm an investor in a breast pump company. I'm not a customer. And I would argue that this notion that the VC needs to understand the business is kind of bullshit. Am I allowed, I'm allowed to swear, right? That's okay, right? It's bullshit. Like, I bet you there's a ton of fintech out there that people don't actually really understand. If you really push them hard, they couldn't write a line of code of that company. They don't actually understand how it works. They think they do. So I don't know. Like, my view is as a founder, you have to be the product expert. So in our portfolio, 34% of our portfolio companies have at least one female founder. I think it's around 11 or 12% are majority, fe majority or exclusively female founded. And 31% of the portfolio companies that we have uh, have a Latinx or African American person on the founding team. So we focus on founders. We, we could probably go all the way down through the company, but we really focus on founders. And I think the trick is like I cringe every time I hear the word pattern matching because we're looking for traits, not resume attributes. So most of the questions I ask founders in diligence are very, uh, anyone here go to the Stanford GSB and take touchy-feely? They're very like touchy-feely, tell me about your childhood, tell me about the things you've overcome in life, tell me about the most difficult person you've worked with, tell me about the kind of ma the best manager you've ever had. <coughs> They're very much like life experience traits questions then really specific questions about the business. Because all I'm really trying to probe is like, is this person tough? And have they thought really hard about the rough edges of their business? And the answer to most of the questions I ask is, I actually don't know. Like, it's unknowable. So if someone's like, it's definitely going to be this way, I'm like, well, it probably won't. And so what we try to do is we try to say, like, precursor, me being an expert in your product area or domain is not a requirement for us to invest. Your ability to convince me that you are an expert is a requirement to invest. I, I, the, the whole diversity question is a, is a really interesting one, right? Because for, you know, dead white males, um, you know, who make up a majority of the, of the industry, you say, you know, how can you know, look at the numbers, you know, the number of, of people of color, the number of women who are getting funded is a minuscule percentage of the whole thing. You're a dead white male, so therefore there clearly is a diversity issue, right? Um, and it's a little hard to argue with that, except for the fact that of every single friggin' investor that I know who, you know, first of all, they're trying to make money. Right? So the, the goal is not to discriminate. The goal is not to whatever. The goal is to get the best person you can with the best founder tied into the, to the, the, the company and who, who will have the biggest success, number one. Number two, there have been multiple surveys shown, the one you referred to, the first round capital survey about women founding teams, which show that diverse teams actually do better. That, they, that if you look across their entire portfolio, teams with women co-founders on, on, on the team just economically do better. So every, every uh, investment firm that I know would, would sell their grandmothers to to, to, to get diverse founders in there, right? So I, and, and so, the, the, you know, every time on the other hand anybody mentions the, the pipeline problem, um, which is that the number of, of, of people, of diverse founders, you know, who pitch is less than the number of, you know, white male dropouts or whatever it is. You know, y y everybody gets beaten up and yelled at and say, oh, it's not a pipeline issue, you have to take, a, take you know, affirmative action, blah, 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 which we, which we, we do. But the fact of the matter is there is a pipeline issue. Uh, I mean, I personally, frankly, New York Angel, Frankly, most VCs I know actually invest in a higher percentage of diverse founders than they get pitched. It still it doesn't equal anywhere near the number of, of you know white males who are getting uh, funded. Um, but it but in in the majority of cases it is not a, for lack of trying, right? So yeah, I mean I think not much to add. I feel like this is a a, a broad issue and one that is near and dear to you know VCs' hearts and especially at Trinity we talk about it a lot. Um, I think the beauty about entrepreneurship is it somewhat democratized the creation of, of of ideas, and I think where we need a lot more work is just within ourselves and the venture community. I mean, I would love every room that we walk into to look like this, as diverse as it is over here. It's just not the case, and I think there's got to be uh, a lot more conscious effort that's put, uh, you know, and we certainly are doing everything that we possibly can to to do that, but our partnership in itself is actually pretty diverse. The founders we fund are pretty diverse. There is still bias everywhere. So, I mean, I could go on, which is probably not a good use of time to add to what these gents have already said. Thank you, very thought-provoking note. And um, do we have time for a question or two, or no? Should we roll? I, don't, I think we're actually a little over. Oh, yeah. okay.
OK, perfect. Well, if you do have questions, you know where you can find them, unless they are running to catch a plane. Thank you so much for your time. <laughs>